Yeah, and, and, and again, we're off on now. We're talking about Alien again, but it, it, with the agendas, critics who haven't played it have said things like, "Oh, well, the agendas are just railroading you because now you have to do this thing." But we've been very careful with the way they're written, and every 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 team who contacts me say, "Oh, we played this and Hammer did that." And and then the next people come play this and Hammer did something completely different, but both of those things fit the agenda right. because it's it's really written in a way for you to just it, it's like um, you're an actor and it's like what's my motivation? Oh, right. Okay, it's this cries my motivation. Now I know how I'm going to handle this, and it's not mm -hmm. at all the way you would have handled it, but it 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 it's just enough to get people who don't role play all the time something to focus on rather than sitting there saying, I don't know what to do with this character mm. or experienced role players can say, Oh, I can take that and do so much with it based on right. what I know my experience. So in both ways, it's fun. Um, and, and in all those ways, it's, it's you taking the character and making it your own. Um, I, I, <clears throat> with Obi-Wan, um, I had to laugh because, Everything that the guy who the actor who's playing the Grand Inquisitor um said about how, oh, I didn't watch any of the show. I wanted to make the role my own. And and also I was like, okay, this is the same as when I give a secret secret agenda out to a um to a player, you know, and he takes it and he's like, All right, I'm gonna play this character this way. So, yeah. you know, I'm 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 it's almost like I'm looking at all reality and equating it to uh, a game <laughs> at this point. <laughs> That's so what we it, do. <laughs> um, so his Grand Inquisitor was not quite the same as the Grand Inquisitor we saw in Rebels, right? Mm. But they yeah. were both clearly the Grand Inquisitor. They both right. they both you know, come from the same basis of this is what this character is going to do, um, and it's two totally different interpretations. So, but I'm a big fan actually of the agendas. I wasn't sure that that was the thing. I wasn't sure when I first opened the box right at the beginning. Was it was everything going to make sense to me? Like the cards. And not just the agenda cards, but the cards. When you open the first, you know, Chariot of the Gods, it's filled with cards. And I'm like, uh, all right. But then within playing the first um Hadley's Hope adventure at the back of the I had for a quick reference just some of the equipment. And I'm like, no, the cards are good. I like the cards. They're a good idea. But the agendas, they didn't take anything away. It really was just adding a layer and it's like you said for for people that are experienced that go like but i've created a good well-rounded character well maybe you have but i never saw the agenda take anything away it just added that little bit extra there's times when a character might go how would i react to this i don't know and sometimes the agenda is just enough of a nudge that they could go okay maybe maybe they'd do this maybe they'd go in this direction and it didn't feel like this is making you do it. it. This is what you have to do. You know, if it said you're greedy, that you're going to just be this one dimensional greedy, put yourself first in every, uh, in every instance, that that's not what the agendas did. And I think, I think, I think part of what has made the agendas work, at least in my case, is the fact that I approach this stuff as a novelist. Because that's where I come from. Like, you know, I, I writing comics, writing novels was my background. And I was like, okay, from a game point of view, I don't want anybody to be one dimensional. I want there to be a good reason why this person would do this thing. And then I also, because of my gaming hobby for, you know, 20 years, I, I know that I want, don't want to take away a player's agency at the same time. So how can I give them this really interesting background to deal with that allows them to take it as they want? Um, <clears throat> I see people who bad things happen in their life and I feel like okay you use that as an excuse to become a Batman villain you know <laughs> it's, it's mm. like um, what was oh, <laughs> I was making dinner last night um, and, with my girlfriend and we were like uh, we were we were frying deep frying chicken cutlet and some of it splattered towards her. And I, I pushed her back from the stove. It's like, you don't want to become a Batman villain. And she's like, what are you talking about? I said, <laughs> well, the chicken grease splatters you. Um, and then you're going to hate chicken and become the chicken hater. And <laughs> she's like, what are you talking about? 
I said, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so or or you could say, wow, is a dumbass to stand so close to that chicken grease? You know, it, it, it it's but the 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 chicken grease situation is there that we give you and you can take it and run with it however right. you want. Um, and this must be the most bizarre example you've ever gotten before, but I apologize. It's just, no, I like to draw up. Yeah, that no, is, it's all good. But I mean, just, that's, that's okay. I was going to say, I'm, you know, to help, um, I guess, um, characters in Carbon Grey and players, you know, uh, you know, have that sort of um, background for them. You've, you've introduced quirks, obligations, remarkable abilities, and mementos as well. Yeah, all of which give you benefits, um, and some of which give you severe disadvantages at the same time that make up for the benefits, you know. Uh, but all yeah. of them, like we said before, all of them give you role playing opportunity. Yeah, and I was just going to say, like with the with the agendas, we were saying like which way people go, and that's why you get Again. one character becomes Reva, and one character becomes Ahsoka. Both had, in the end, horrible things happen to them. Ahsoka was put on trial. And then they mm. went, oh, no, we're, we're, we're sorry, we were wrong. But in the end, she's like, I'm not coming back. But she didn't yeah. become Reva. She, in, yeah. Even at the end of Rebels, she lost her clones and only a couple of them stood by her. She went through an, an Anakin and all of that. She could have easily have become a Reva, but she didn't. She became Fulcrum and then the Ahsoka we now see in Mandalorian not quite the same, but similar sort of to Reva, and she became a hate-filled just, the ends justify the means, I'll do lots of terrible things as long as I can get to to Vader mm -hmm. and you get those as you said, choices and direction and what sometimes little things lead to big things and big things lead to huge things and I think the agendas help those sort of decisions they definitely help people break break out of their shell when they're timid about role playing, you know. Yeah. Um, and, and to me, that's that's the most important thing with this stuff because you want people to lose their inhibitions when they're when they're playing. You want them right. to to feel like, hey, here's my chance to to do these things I can't do in real life, and maybe I can be a little bolder than I am in real life because I feel there's too much pressure there. This is my safe zone. You know right. that well, I my <clears throat> um technically he's not my brother, but um my best friend in high school, his parents split up and his mother went back to Australia and his father moved to the Midwest and we were in New York and he wanted to go to art college with me. And so my parents became his legal guardian and he moved in with with, with me. Okay. And um so I call him my brother, and, and as far as I'm concerned. Emotionally, he was my brother, you know, and right. he still he lives in England now, so I don't see him very much. Um, but Jason was my brother, and we used to role play Star Wars all the time, one on one. Okay, which is not, you know, one on one role playing is not typical. At least it may be more now, but it, than it was back then. Yeah. But <clears throat> we would play one on one, and like I remember at one point, I because his character came from royalty, and his planet had been taken over by the Empire, so he was like a deposed. Prince is the best way to describe it, but um, and then uh, they went back to the they went back to their home world and were dealing with resistance stuff. And his cousin wound up being given to him. It was a kid character to take care of when they left. And I made this cousin a pain in the ass. Okay, <laughs> and he got into a fight with the cousin character. His character got in a fight with the cousin character, which became him and I sitting there yelling at each other. Okay, and. We we took a step back after a little bit and realized we were actually dealing with stuff that was going on in the household at the time. Mm -hmm. And we had put it into the game without realizing it. And and we let off all the steam and felt so much better after it. Now, if that's not a healthy thing, I don't know what else is. Yeah. Because we were able to work through our issues of what was going on that were beyond our control and be, be okay with it in the end because of playing. And it was therapeutic role playing. Yeah. And I don't even know if it, there was such a thing back then or called such a thing back then. But nowadays, people look at it like that, you know. And 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 I just think because of that, I want I want everybody to be able to 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 find their true selves through gaming, to 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 deal with issues that are going on in their life, 
and maybe come out of it a little healthier because of what they were able to accomplish on the gaming table. And I just think there's lots of opportunities for that. And I'm trying to build that stuff into right. what we're doing. Well, and I think that it's a, and it's an important thing in Alien. I know we said jump between Alien and Carbon Gray, but with Alien, uh, it's got that element. Like if you're playing Star Trek as an example, and depending on the character makeup in Star Wars, you're the good guys. You're fully the good guys, and you're going to do good guy things, especially Star Trek. You're not going to screw each other over. But in Alien, if your character panics, they could run and try to seal the door like Burke did from the other players and i think it's really cool how alien it's sort of built in where it's like don't be a dick like just you know be a dick but if your character panics and does that trying to save themselves and they've now forgotten that they just don't care now about the other characters it's okay because players would worry about that before you know like you'd, you'd be like oh but you know, I, I, I don't want to do this. It's like, no, it's okay. That's It's part of this, this setting. If your character is panicked, you're a mechanic. You've seen the xenomorph. It's burst through the, into the room. You've panicked. You've run through the door. You've slammed that door. You've locked that door. They're banging on it, trying to get through. You don't have to worry about it. Like, you don't have to feel bad about it. That's part. Of, and it's sort of built in. And I think that was really important because that's one of the things that players can worry about not so much the characters that's you know depends on their makeup but the players can worry about that thinking oh i've screwed over adam and and it's like no it's okay if, and that was sort of you really honestly there. think that <laughs> 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 yes your face it's tells okay. all <laughs> it's okay because it fits the story like, right it, it makes sense that this character would have done that okay like i had right. the opposite of what you just said happen um gloriously happened at at uh, game hole con when i was running um so there, there's there's this big chunk of heart of darkness that got cut out of the final version okay mm -hmm. and so when i run games at conventions i'm running that um so it's it's like a secret behind the scenes scene um that that takes place i guess between the it takes place between the um Getting the action started, I can't remember. That's not exactly how it's called, but that's yep. what it's something like that. And Act One, okay. Um, and and Thomas was completely right to tell me get this the hell out of here because when I play it out at the conventions, I was like, wow, this is like its own thing. This this the, 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 you play this, and then Heart of Darkness has a completely different feel. Um, so it definitely needed to get taken out, but it's really fun as as uh, hey you guys get to be part of what didn't happen at a convention. Right. So it, it's it's great to be running it the way I am now, but it definitely did not belong in the box set, okay? Right. Um, but when you take the characters' agendas um, that are in Heart of Darkness, I don't know if you guys... Have you guys played Heart of Darkness? I don't know. Nope, I own it. So you have Heart of Darkness, you just haven't played I it? I haven't. We just haven't <clears> played it yet. <throat> okay, okay. So... If if the players at the con had been playing their characters that they love, that they take from a campaign character that they love to make, and they, they've kept this character alive, some of the decisions that were made at this take game table never would have happened. But they mm. made it because it fits the character, and they had the freedom of, I'm we're playing for four hours, and then I'm not going to see this GM again until next year at game. <laughs> right. right. So it's like... <clears throat> This guy decided he was going to um, try to pull someone out of the way of this alien who'd pop through a ventilation shaft, okay? But at the same time, the other player had decided, I was going to take the flamethrower and I'm going to I'm going flamethrow this thing. So what happened was the character who was in the way, who was definitely going to get harmed, got thrown out of the way, but the alien and the guy who did the saving got torched <laughs> it made perfect sense. with their agendas and with the fact that well i'm already in this motion i can't stop this right yeah. and i actually told the player i was like this is kind of messed up so i'll give you the opportunity to not pull the trigger and he's like well honestly i don't think my character 
I think my character was already pulling the trigger because this was totally my intent. I don't think it's right if I stop that. And the mm. guy who was going to get torched said, no, it makes perfect sense if I get torched at this point. So we just <laughs> let it go. And it was awesome. And it fit. The, and, and then that guy ran out of the room on fire. <laughs> And like one of setting something on fire in the process. <laughs> and it, it was ridiculously fantastic. And it was everybody embracing what they had on paper in front of them. Right. Um, right. So you know, and, and there was a freedom in that also that wouldn't have come from playing your 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 beloved 25th level fighter. You, right. you know, uh, it, it, that 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 just allows a completely different type of role playing. Um and there's no question that everybody had fun at the table. Um, well, half of them died, you know, and, and and isn't that what we're doing this for to have fun? So. Right, right. So, what's the difference between, um, you know, for some of the viewers, um, because we well, we we've often heard, you know, steampunk, uh, diesel punk. So, if you're if you're, I'm sure there's a viewer out there who's going to say, well, actually, and put in the comments <laughs> something that, I'm yeah, wrong yeah, wrong. yeah. Okay, but from my interpretation. <laughs> Okay, it's about the technology level. Mm. Like steampunk is all you know, right? Everything runs on steam and gears steam. and stuff like that. Okay, so you can have a clockwork man or something like that. Okay, but diesel punk, um, it, it's the technology level that we're at in World War One. Um, mm. so it's 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 taking that technology and extremifying it, just like we're extremifying the idea of what steam engines can do. You, you know what I mean? Um, so, so it's 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 a diesel level of technology, and we're going to take it to an extreme. That's what it comes down to. And so now everybody jump in the comments and tell tell me how I'm wrong, and I will accept <laughs> accept your uh, uh, your judgment. <laughs> well, I so I so agree with you there because there, there's um, definitely you know uh, elements of uh, you, you know there's more technology in there um, we have tanks running around you know World War one tanks uh, that obviously run on uh, diesel uh, you know with huge cannons on top of them uh, the unicorn for example uh, classic tank. I love that tank um, uh, you know but I I can still imagine that they would have um, steam trains you know the old um, steam trains rather than absolutely, absolutely yeah um we had a lorry in one of our games much to the confusion of some of our players that did not know what a lorry was that um, is correct that was correct yes, <laughs> yes uh, it's a truck yes <laughs> <A> spoiler <laughs> a lorry is a truck that's that's yeah, what so they we've... call them very old Britain. we had yeah. a few of those yeah we had a few of those moments where it was like it'll be a while and we'd sort of go you, you do know what we're riding on, right? It's like, no, nope, <laughs> no, nope, just I'm just no, nope, we're just going along with it. And it's like, I have no idea what a lorry is. And then we'd like, yeah, it's just a truck. <laughs> Essentially, it's just a truck. <laughs> but there's a few of those those old terms or uh, European terms for for some things we the, the crop up every now and again. Yeah, it's appropriate for this. You know, mm. if I tell you you're in, it's a truck pulls up, or if I tell you a lorry pulls up, if I tell you a lorry, you're immediately going to think, well, I'm either in England or Europe. If I right. tell you it's a truck, you're like, all right, it's, it's uh, I, 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 it definitely in a, it could be America, it could be anywhere in the world, though. So you know, you want to define it with those with those proper words. It's, um, uh, you use auto, automobile instead of car because that's what they were saying back then. You know, it, yep. it, right? It's we call a car an automobile, but we're more than likely to say it's a damn car <laughs> at mm, this point. Right? Back then, they right. did not. You know. Um, just like the horseless carriage, you know, that's another one. That's that's a, a good term for back then. Um, oh, know, that's it, a good one. I hadn't thought of that. It's uh, it, it's it's interesting, and this is an, a, a historical aside to what we're talking about. We went from horse and carriage to horseless carriage to airplane really fast, hmm. then to to oh we're we're going to the moon and and now we 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 have an internet and you know we didn't have phones at all and now we have wireless phones and it's like th this past 120 years now has been an increase a crazy increase in technology and and everything for the human race um uh, leaps and bounds and 
war has always been at the forefront of it. Mm. Um, which is sadly, you know, I guess what mankind is. But you know, it, it makes you wonder what's when when are we going to tap out with this techno right. technological increase? When is it going to slow down and go back to the pace that it was before, or is it not? And in another couple of hundred years, we're just going to be luminous beings that can teleport around whenever we want, you know? Who knows? Um I want I I I wonder if there is anything that has papers that have been produced that can track what what the li most likely end of this is other than destruction um because eventually yeah, we, we are we, we, <laughs> we have a lot of that in science fiction space 1999 and uh, ba babylon technology, 5 and our technology is definitely outpacing our morality oh yes mm. absolutely um oh there's one uh, the game's con continuity flux aspect seems expanded from what we saw in the comics. How right. complicated was sorting all of that out? How easy was it to balance? And how do you mm. think it affects the game? I mean, in the, in, in the comics, it kind of has a finality to it, doesn't it? <laughs> I mean, it kind of goes the way through the, it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I don't know. I don't know. Uh, the, the, the trick was to expand it so that it would be oh that's my cat if you can hear him. Yeah, um, adrian yeah yes yes uh expand it so that it could have like serious consequences without being the end all that it is in the actual comic mm -hmm. um so so i guess what it comes down to is the consequences in the comic are happening on a localized scale in your game um, so, because if you mess up an area really bad, it's like that area is not going to recover and will probably lead to what's happening in the comic, you know. Um, but game balance wise, and I need to do more writing about this in the in the future books and also in bl my blog posts probably. But um, if the players cause something terrible. I think it's up to them to find a way to balance it at that point. So if players' activity has led to this continuity cluster, uh, cluster flux, um, <clears throat> then they need to use their hero points to try and, 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 and whatever they can to try and close that and try to make it, bring it back to balance. It's in their hands at that point. They did this. Mm -hmm. If you have a villain who did it, and I'm going to feed my cat while we're in this interview, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> he's attacking my knees. Um, if the, if the players did this, they it's up to them to fix it. If you have a villain who did it, that's a somewhat different story. And there should be a game balance thing built in for the GM to make sure that the players can figure it out. But once it's their problem, once they caused it, um I would give them I would give them ways that they can mitigate it if they don't have the tools already. Um, mm. But they should have the tools, honestly. <clears throat> they should have the tools there, even if it means sacrifice on their part. Mm. Um, I don't... This I, I, I played Dungeons & Dragons for 20 years. I love Dungeons & Dragons. But this is not Dungeons & Dragons. This is not your character's going to get out of this necessarily. Mm. Um, you know, and even if your character dies, there are options with the continuity flux that your character could die and then walk out of the flux, you know, <laughs> depending on how things go. Um, so there's um I don't know, I, I don't know if I don't know if game balance applies when it was there in the beginning. You were told bad things happen if you mess with the continuity. You're going to keep doing it. Then the game balance is the ramifications of what has just happened. Um, mm. At that point, then the game balance <laughs> is more in your hands than the GM's hands. I think for our group, the dynamic, you got most of the, the group that don't understand what the continuity uh, flux 
uh, you know, beholds and you have this one person who does, who's, you know, going out to, to, to write these uh, inconsistencies in the, uh, in the, in those uh, breaks. And we've got one who wants to try and embrace the power that, um, you know, that, that, that continuity pluck, uh, flux provides, but um, uh, it was interesting to see how uh, Emily's character herself was getting stressed because the other characters were actually causing um, more issues with the the flux in the tent in that local environment, right? And, and she's trying to explain this is getting worse, but yeah. Um, and how much how much story came out of that though? A lot, right? Yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah. So there was so, there was a little arc, yeah, that led into that, and so uh, I think in Ashes to Ashes, you know, uh, there is an actual rift that uh, a tear that uh, I won't spoil it for anyone who hasn't played it, but uh, you know, there's options, uh, and actually, the players, even though I knew what the options were, the players actually came up with the. Um, uh, the option of what they wanted to do to 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 sort out that issue and um while the role you know telling i think one of the things you say in uh in the book is you know target numbers do you tell the players or do you not tell the players in this case you know it was it, it was good not to tell the players whether they had succeeded or not um but yeah in all outward respect they think they achieve the result, but they might not necessarily have. <laughs> it, it did give me a um, cat moment from Red Dwarf where I got to say, so what is it? It's a tear in the fabric of reality and then turn to the other adept. So what is it? <laughs> it's reality can have sort of multiple faces turn back to the first. so what is it <laughs> yeah i mean everything you just said to me i i uh, tells me that whether that became unbalanced or not that was a good time at the table and it was it was uh it's good story and to have your players be responsible for something that that bad is coming means that they are responsible for cleaning it up mm, yep and if they can't if it's too far gone where they can't clean it up, what they need to do is the right thing for them to do. What they need to do is whatever the hell they feel like, because that's the whole right. point of role playing. Please don't forget what you're going to say, but yeah. the right thing for them to do would be to uh, try to evacuate the area. Mm. <laughs> but go ahead. What were you going to say? Um, which leads us into the question, uh, are the players the good guys or is there more of a moral ambiguity to this, you know, um, well, there's no, that's the thing. There's no, I always had a problem with alignment in mm. Dungeons and Dragons, okay? And it's like, it, it, it's good as a guideline, okay? But the thing is, is that nobody is, nobody is, are there people that are really just evil for evil's sake? Because like, even someone who's terribly evil probably thinks they're doing the right thing. Hmm. You know, even if they're completely a twisted serial killer who is obviously not doing the right thing, they believe there's a reason for why they're doing this. So they have purpose in their life for I'm doing this because if I don't, then um, then the demons will eat everybody who's left minds. So I've got to kill these people who, whose names all begin with S. You, you know, <laughs> wait, OK, whatever, buddy. But but that's that's, <laughs> that's that's their purpose. They're not they don't think they're doing a bad thing. Um, even 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 dictators and terrible people in history, they had their reasons for what they did. Was it right? Mm. No, I am not condoning any of this behavior. Please, nobody take that out of what I'm saying here. And I don't, I, don't you dare make an edited version where I am saying that. <laughs> uh, you know, so and so was misunderstood. No, that's not what I'm saying. Yeah. My point is, is that everybody in reality thinks they're doing something for the right reason. You know, mm. um. Uh, if we have a politician, I'm not going to name names. If we have a politician who's doing a whole bunch of terrible things, um, 
Mm-hmm. Are they sitting there thinking, hey, hey, then I'll do this bad thing? Or are they thinking, well, yeah, that's right. We have to do this because of X, Y, and Z. And mm-hmm. the other people won't be able to benefit if I don't do this. And I won't be able to benefit. <laughs> and I, I, I need to benefit from this. You know, so that they have a righteous um, attitude about what they are doing. And, and we're all like that. So who is really the good guys and the bad guys? And is there such a thing? You know, or is there what's morally right and wrong? And some of us try to achieve what's what morally right, but even the people who are doing the wrong thing, they think they're morally doing the right thing. So are yeah. they doing the they're doing the wrong thing for the right reasons, or for maybe it's even the wrong reasons, but they think that's the right reasons. Mm-hmm. It's a really complicated, ambiguous thing of what this is what real life is. Nothing comes down to the white hats and the black hats. Mm-hmm. Um and I've I've always tried to put in all my fiction this shades of gray. One of the things that <clears throat> I had to laugh about um, in my in my I, I I I am I'm liberal, I'm Democrat. Okay, I'm, I'm liberal person. I, I'm not a conservative. I am not a Republican. Okay, but when I wrote my Planet of the Apes novel, I did not make Doctor Zayas a villain. He's doing bad things, but for what he thinks are good reasons. Okay, and I I made him conservative i made him like a republican okay and i've had so many people who are republicans come to me and say well you really get it you really understood it when you wrote dr zayas you really and you made him a good guy did i <laughs> you know I don't, I don't there but but you got that out of it you know um it tells me a lot right there um so you know Do- dr zayas in planet of the apes did if for did did what he did what he thought was for good reasons um mm. he wanted he thought i'm saving i'm saving the i'm saving civilization for you guys this is what i'm doing so you're gonna thank me later on um yeah but you know what that really wasn't a good thing you did there um mm. but and and we know people who do this in our lives all the time you know even even if you have a uh a parent or a relative who's disapproving of the way you've chosen to live your life and the choices Mm. you've made. They're disapproving of that thing, not because they're a jerk, even though they're doing jerky things, because they think your life could have been so much better if you did this other thing without understanding that that other thing is not really you. And you did this thing in your life because that's who you are. And it's important that you live your life. So, so yeah, the moral ambiguity thing is, 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 is important. (laughs) Because it's what reality is, and it's important for us to deal with this stuff in fiction because it'll help us understand why we've made the choices we've made in real life as well. It comes right. back to that whole right. therapeutic that I talked about before. Um, so I'm going to get off my little pedestal now. <laughs> <laughs> Normal things. But but um, but yeah, it, it's. I want my villains to be three-dimensional. I want them to have... And my heroes. I want them all to have reasons why they do things. And there are heroes that do bad things. Uh, a, per- a perfect example. Um, um, I don't know how much Star Trek fans you guys are. Mm-hmm. But um, but uh, uh, Cisco in that episode of D Space Nine, where he does all these terrible things to bring the Romulans into the war so that they can have the support. And, and he's like, can I live with it? I can live with it. I think I can live with it. And then he deletes his captain's log at the end of it. Mm-hmm. Um, he did some terrible shit there and 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 allowed terrible things to happen in order to save the the, the quadrant by letting yeah. by bringing the Romulans into the war under false pretenses. Um mm. but he's a hero, <laughs> you know. Yeah. There's no question that Cisco is a hero, but he had to do dirty things to get to get us to survive so that he could be a hero. Yeah, um that might have been the Romulan one. Because there was one where he goes and he um, punches Garrick, and he's like, "You murdered him," yeah. and he's and yep. he's yep. Like, that might have been the part of the Romulan one because he's like, and Garrick's yep. like, "You needed this, and I did what you couldn't, and you can pretend right. you didn't know about it, but but you, your greater you good is this because you knew I would yeah. do it for you, yeah." yeah. Mm. And all it, all it took was the death of someone who wasn't really that good in the first place, and yep. Yep. you should be able to live with that. Absolutely. I think it was Absolutely. to do with the Romulan. It's a long time, but I remember that scene. Yeah. I just don't quite remember all the clicks to it. And he's having to look at himself, and he, it's like, yeah, what's... It's they, just they now it's the a Rom- hard, hard choice. They, they tried to convince this Romulan senator 
to come in and to bring the Romulans in the war on the side of the Federation against the Dominion, okay? And when that clearly wasn't going to happen, Garrick had the guy killed and made it look like the Dominion did it. <laughs> so, mm. so, you know, and, and Cisco went along with it because this is how this is how we're going to make this happen because it has to happen. If it doesn't happen, then we're going to lose the war and then there goes everything the Federation has fought for and 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 the whole entire Alpha Quadrant is just going to be run by the Dominion. So he did a bad thing and allowed a bad thing to happen and he got behind a bad thing because that was the only way to make the yeah. good thing happen. So, you know, yeah, so so we, I want our characters, heroes and villains alike, to be three-dimensional. I want you to feel like there's a reason for this. We're long, we're long past the 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 mustache, mustache twirling villain who ties the victim to the railroad track just because why not? You know, right. that, that in, in, in our in our entertainment, we're well past that. Mm. And there are people who are still clinging to the white hats and bad hats thing. I saw somebody online on Facebook, I had to laugh um, mm. because they said. Um, there was some interview with the new director of the the new Indiana Jones movie who said that there's no white and black here. There's also like shades of gray in the new Indiana Jones movie. And this person got mad at that because he said, Indiana Jones is pulp and pulp has always been about black hats and white hats. And I was like, no, it hasn't. The heroes that are in pulp are usually people who are like, eh, you know, he's a little shady for what he's doing there, but it's a good thing he's trying to do. You know, yeah. And, the, the pulp itself has always been about that. Um, that the, the, the detective who's sleeping with someone's wife and, and you know, he, he kind of did doing something on the side that's a little shady, but he's going to be the hero of the story. Um, that I'm like, you, you've totally misunderstood the genre that you pretend to love. Good job there, buddy. <laughs> you know? um, but, and, and that's, we can say the Nazis are bad. We can say that. They're the bad guys. Okay. But how many of those people were following orders and doing because they believed in their country without understanding what was actually they were doing there? Yeah. You know, so and and the citizens of Germany, <clears throat> are they to blame for what their government was doing? I mean, did they even vote them into office? <laughs> they kind of, you know, it, 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 they're victims too in a lot of ways. So it, it's it's not, there's nobody who's just, these people are all evil. And that's mm. something that's important that's being changed in um, things like Dungeons and Dragons nowadays. Because, you know, we had we had the drow were all evil. Mm. You know? No, they weren't. In fact, it, for, since the 90s, we've had dritz and... And 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 we were showing there that you know that they were people and that the it's really the rulership the leadership and 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 uh, that that was making these people be like this um, and there were people living under oppression and that that's what usually is the case um, and I don't know why we got off on this weird tangent but it, it's 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 important to me that in our fiction we have characters that are fully developed one way or the other. And that's where you get your secret agenda as an alien also. Because I make mm. sure that if someone's doing that terrible thing, there's a pretty damn good reason why they're doing right. it. Right. Maybe maybe the person who's betraying you needs to pay hospital bills for someone they love. You know, okay, they're doing a bad thing, but they're up against a wall and people do desperate things when they're up against a wall. Yeah. Then that just like, I mean, Burke, Burke in Aliens, he's kind of a one-dimensional villain in a lot of yep. ways. <laughs> He's that he's that he's that typical eighties um, um, corporate asshole. Okay, mm. but there was so much else going on. You could sort of get away with having one like yes. that. Yes, if he but was I mean, the character wise, I prefer the moral ambiguity of the the, the prisoners on Fury One Six One. Because I mean, they're clearly bad guys, and they're there for doing horrible things. But you still cared to them about them as human beings when the things were going on. If you know, depending on which version of the movie you watch, um, a lot of people say in the theatrical version they couldn't tell who was who um, because there wasn't as much of the development that's in the assembly cut and the special edition movie. I don't know if you guys have seen the longer cut. No, um, not yet. No, oh, got it. It's so much better. I mean, I love the theatrical version when I saw it in the theaters, but mm. this blows that away, and I, I, I don't think I'll ever watch the theatrical version again because of it. Um, hmm. it's it's characters are much more developed and there's much more that you see of what um the director was going for there that wasn't achieved because of studio interference well that's quite often the case uh, 
right? Director's cuts, I think, generally are better. Um, this is not. It's important to note. This is not the director's cut because he will never have anything to do with Alien again. He did not come back to direct to do a director's cut, even though he was invited back. So this is the assembly cut, which other people put together based on what the direction of the movie he was trying to go for that we're aware of. <laughs> so it is not an actual director's cut, uh, which is why they call it the special edition and the assembly cut. Okay. Um, he he's so mad with with Fox about what happened with that he will never have anything to do with them again. <laughs> that that that's 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 a Batman villain thing right there. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> so wow, we've gone off on some tangents here. Ah, that's um, what that's what we do. That's what we do. But at least at least if I mean, it, it, you know if he cut everyone's throat after that, you know, it'd be like he could have a trademark move. The director's cut. Ugh. I'm here all week. Yeah, well, so I think I have a problem with my internet. Can you guys hear me? <laughs> yep. <laughs> was the focus on Middle Europa because of the focus is in the comic, or was that just where you also felt the RPG should be? Um, I. I it's a it's an RPG based on this comic, and that's what the most developed was. Um, I believe. Well, I know for a fact that um, Huang is working on a sequel to the comic, and cool. I believe it's taking it out of Middle Europa. Um, and if that's the case, then we will do source books for the other areas. You know, mm. um, I didn't want to. This is a this is a world he's still developing. I'm not going to just mm -hmm. run off in tangents and do things, you know. So right. everything we did, we had to get approval for. Um, and and if I knew he was going to deal with a certain country, I'd stayed away, stayed right. stayed away from it. Because we're trying to, uh, I don't want to. I I I will never. I, I don't ever want my work to be. I took this off in a tangent where I wanted it to do go, and it totally viol is violated or violates something else that the creator does later. Mm. Um, if, if we can talk, if I if I have the ability to talk to the creator to make that make sure that it happens, that doesn't happen, then that's good. Um, with something like Alien, you never know if All Ridley right. Scott is going to go and then suddenly write a story that's going to violate everything I've just done. But I try to work within the parameters that I'll make sure that doesn't happen as much as possible. <laughs> But it's entirely possible that he will rewrite everything, and 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 I try to explain this in my blog, where I talk about canon, and the tears of canon. Yeah. Um, the only people who can violate tier two canon would be a big name director or writer who is going to do a new film, mm -hmm. because they will always. No one's going to say, "Well, you know, the novels kind of uh, say something different, Ridley." So I don't know if you can do that. No one's going to say that to him, and they shouldn't. Mm -hmm. Ridley Scott should be able to bring to the franchise what he wants to bring. Okay, um, and then someone like my job as a canon consultant, my job is after Ridley does that crazy thing, to sit there and say, "All right, how can we fit this in with what we had before? What can we save? What can we salvage? What we what can we just say?" that was a misinterpretation of something that happened. Where where can we work this in that it makes sense? So my job is not to set canon. My job is to run damage control for canon, if that makes any sense. Right, right. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, it, it was a pleasure to work with Wang and be able to go to him and say, hey, what do you think of this? Does this work with what you wanted, blah, blah, blah. And in most cases, I, um, I was completely correct. There were things with the map we were completely wrong on, which they corrected us on, and we were able to fix. Um, mm. But um, but uh, like things like adding the wolves, he's like, I, I never thought anything like that, but yeah, it works, so do it. Mm. You know? um, he could have just as easily said, that's a little weird, don't do that. And then I would have saved my wolf idea mm. for something else, you know? Mm. Um, so it's, it's, it, it's, it's, a, it's a pleasure to work with the person who created it rather than fingers crossed that this doesn't get changed later, you know, mm. but, but tier two, tier two continuity uh, or Canon in these things like <clears throat> alien is all the novels that are not contradicting anything. They're all the, they're, they're the stuff in the game, which is 
filling in the blanks without taking it too far. A perfect right. example is I've avoided in all the role playing stuff. I've avoided Planet Four and the stuff that comes out of Covenant because if if Ridley was to continue that, we're going to find out what happened there, mm-hmm. and I can, I will not touch that area because I know that's likely where he's going to go. Um, but there's plenty of other places to play within the universe without going mm-hmm. there. Mm-hmm. So SPG had asked, why was it World War One, like a alternate World War One, rather than Napoleonic World War Two or modern? Yeah, it never occurred to me to ask when why. Um, I was just like, oh, World War One, neat. We don't see a lot of stuff there. I mean, I was excited about it because I was like, everyone goes to World War Two. We barely right. yeah. touch World War One comparatively. Yeah. Um, yeah. And <clears throat> it's it's funny now. It's like. Okay, we're in 2023. We are further away from Vietnam now than when I was a kid. We were away from World War II. Yep. And yet World War II has always seemed like this thing that was so far away. Even back in the 70s, it felt like yep. that was like a long time ago. Um, it, it, something else that's terrifying um next year is the 25th anniversary of the phantom menace yeah <laughs> does that make you feel old <laughs> uh, it will when emily's here and she tells you she was five i think it was when it came out <laughs> uh, we brought our camera yeah. which film it was but we were like oh that was such a good we went to the cinema and saw that adam and willow. he's like yeah wasn't it, willow? Uh, it might have been but i thought it was something after that oh, but it yeah been. it was something it wasn't it didn't feel to us drastically um old and adam sort of said did you ever go to the cinema to see to see that and she's like i wasn't even born when that came out and it's like <laughs> uh, uh, all right <laughs> um yeah but world war one was a uh, hundred years ago now yeah yep, hundred years. Yeah. years so it's it's um yeah it was it, 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 it was appealing to me because Right there, because I was like, okay, we don't see a lot of stuff with that comparatively to World War II. So there's, and that I know how I I, I did had done research in the past on what hell that trench warfare was. Right. So I thought that something without knowing, without having read the comic, I was already interested because mm. of that. Um, you were the GM, so did you have GM related stuff? Because I don't want to speak GM stuff because I I was playing my cavalry scout with my bad German accent. Ge- bad German accent. Well, um, no. <laughs> okay, it was a bad German accent, bad but it was a Europa. fantastic Middle Europa accent. I kept, I kept falling into Russian. Yeah, um, you did. Yeah, da, <laughs> da. <laughs> <laughs> um, I like how in in chapter eight, I was going to say, you know, any advice for GMs running this? Uh, I think because um, there is such a wide variety of archetypes. Um, it's, I, I guess for me, it was a little bit daunting to have different archetypes um, and all not not combat oriented, right? But um, knowing that, but knowing that they all have different skills uh, that they can bring to the table, uh, right? But getting them into the actual mission um, to start with was. Probably for me, the 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 biggest daunting aspect of of running the the game. Um, do you have any advice for GMs regarding that? Like, uh, because imagine if you have like a pilot, for example, um, but the mission's totally ground based. Um, um, <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> you have a town being evacuated, and the free lady. Um, needs an escort from the military mm-hmm. and the pilot crashed in the area and he's going to hang out with you guys until he can get back to the line, front lines when he can get on another plane. You know, okay, so now we've got a mission set up with the, these are the archetypes that are with us. You know, this is something that actually Eric and I were working on with this new game, which I can't tell you about yet. We were, we're like, okay, we want to create the adventure that's part of the quick start and we want it to be, we want to show people there's a lot of opportunities here. So we're going to make six pre-gens that are six vastly different character types 
that if you know this property, you'd be like, wait, how are they making that work? And we're going to make it work so that you guys can be like, oh, wow, there's lots of different things we can do with these archetypes that I thought could have nothing to do with each other. So it, it's funny that you brought that up because we literally were having that discussion this afternoon and we came up with something, which I'm not going to tell you here, which was a perfect adventure that will make people say, oh, wow, I didn't think of that. So, yeah, so what I just came up with at the top of my head there, that that's one way to get them together. And then what you do is, the, 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 thank God we have this pilot because the only way we're going to get out of this war zone is if we steal a plane and get this free lady back to where we're going. Okay, so now you've got the beginnings of an adventure here, okay? So you can you can play that out over like four or five sessions, okay? And then after that, I, I guess, I don't know how you're going to have the free lady be involved with the mission after that yep so i Maybe i guess campaign you know yeah i was i i was sort of lucky in in the sense <laughs> that uh we had a sawbones um we had uh what was your character aaron the i am the uh, cavalry scout cavalry scout um the Darman adept and the the crazy adept guy the um descending apostate the, the, yeah um so bringing them all together for me was a little bit of a, a challenge at the start, but um, uh, because I wanted to continue on. So um, I've had to come up with creative ways to introduce that. Well, I introduced them to, you know, together at the, in the very first, you know, saving the children mission. And then from there, they now have sort of this relationship uh, with each other. Um, and I guess the the continuity issue was how I brought everyone together. Um, it's not going to be like that for I guess every every group, but um, it it does provide you with a challenge. But I mean, it's such a creative uh, challenge. The uh, which leads sort of into would car is carbon gray more suited to you know just having those one off sort of games or do you think um, you can campaign it? Well, if the free lady if the free lady has a family that's wealthy and they get back, then maybe because she was on the front lines and saw all this stuff, she wants to um, fund a, a group that's going to be going behind enemy lines and getting people who can't out. And so now she's actually going to go along with them to make sure her money's spent right. And now you've got like an A-team type of situation where the, the sponsor goes with them. And then, then there you go. There's your campaign. Now you've got it set up. You, you know what I'm saying? It's it, yeah. It, there's always something that can be done to make this work together. So that's um, that would actually work with um, having the GM and the players talk to each other as well yeah. um, <clears throat> and communicating that. Yeah. Something else that I was playing with which we decided not to go with actually this afternoon when we were coming up with this thing for the quick start i was talking about was because i don't know how to make this work yet um because it, it's it's counterintuitive to the way gaming is usually set up um but i like the idea of gm has to have one session one-on-one -on -one with each player before mm -hmm. they all meet so you set up an adventure that's going to lead them into a situation where they're going to meet the other players. And you, 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 you set, you set that up so that all of them end a certain way. And then you have, you know, five weeks in, you have five players in this situation, in this scenario, five weeks in, everybody has to get together. And now we're picking up where we left off where we all meet together. So everybody has a story that they've played that has logically led them to the point where they meet everybody else. It seems like a lot of work. And I haven't figured out how to. You, it's not something you work into a quick start. Yeah, <laughs> mm, <laughs> but, mm, yeah. It, it's, it's it's definitely something that we've done. Well, I I've done with one of the other games that we've played. Um, done that individually with each character before they get in because uh, I think from our perspective, you all meet at the but you know the 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 tavern. So wow. that's so cliche. It's like ah, oh, slap your head. You know. Uh, uh, everyone's got to have a story. So um, doing that one-on-one, -on -one, I think was uh, really good because it provided everyone with their the story, whether they chose to tell the other players or the other characters at the time, um, you know, some, some secrets were hidden, right? Um, but everyone knew their position in the party uh, dynamic. So 
Um, we always have a session zero too. So um, people, uh, especially when we're starting a new game, so everyone is all on the same level. Uh, how does my character know your character? Um, you know, when, you know, uh, things like that, don't we, Aaron? So mm -hmm. any advice? And it was that? important for Carbon Grey, I think, because it, it is different. It's familiar, but different. And then you get things like, am I aware of the order? Like, I wouldn't know lots about them. I'm a cavalry scout, but am I even aware of them? Because this child who's not a child shows up. Is that normal? Like, you know, there's those little things. It's like, I still have to decide how I'm going to react. But if it's like, his orders, you're going to do what she says. Okay. Um, this is really weird. It's a kid, like two, two and a half feet tall. Which is, I'm three and a half. Regardless, <laughs> you know, it's like there's this kid who's saying we're going to go off and do these important things, and you're going to do it, do it. Like, is that something that I'm aware of exists, so that it's not such a like you know strange? So that, yeah, those session zeros for Carbon Gray, was, was, I thought was very important to sort of mm. hammer out. But I think in general, session zeros can be good. Just in general. I know Emily had a very oh, important question. Very, and I had super a very important, important question. Yeah, her super important question was: Is Adrian going to be in Carbon Gray? Because <laughs> he's an alien. Is yeah. he going to expand his repertoire? You know, I was so happy to get him into Alien that I hadn't thought about that or moving forward. <laughs> well, Emily that? has. I. I, I I appreciate that, and I'm sure he appreciates it as well. Um, the thing is, is that cats are important to Alien because of Jones. Yes, you know. Yes. Yep. So, um, if I had a wolf dog, <laughs> then it would be in Carbon Gray. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't know. It, it, it just depends on the property, and it, because because of Jonesy, it was super important for me to get Adrian in there. Um, and I don't, I don't know if, if I said it on your guys' show, or whatever, but it was something that I wanted, um, since the core book, mm. and I just decided to write it into this adventure and see if they said no, because if I said it to them, they probably would have said no. And so when I wrote it in, I got some feedback about, oh, I don't know about this, da da da. But then the higher ups were like, no, no, this is good, this is good. So I was very happy they kept it. Um, <clears throat> and but my it, question. Oops, sorry. Yeah. No, I was gonna um, say it comes to a point where it's like if you're gonna try this, you just gotta roll the dice and, and hope that they don't make you yeah. rewrite it. Mm. Yep. Yeah. Mm. Uh it's po possibly the most asked question in Alien, and we didn't ask when we were talking about Alien, because it didn't seem relevant, but I think it's incredibly relevant to Carbon Gray, and that is is the predator going to be in Carbon Gray? Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> That's the big plot twist. <laughs> the end of the campaign book. I'm sorry, I've given it away. If I had a dime. <laughs> That's... What a great idea. Yeah. <laughs> well, some I mean, we like... also, yeah. Some people like their chocolate yep. in their peanut butter. Yeah. Some people like their predator and their alien. <laughs> mm. I'll take the chocolate and peanut butter, but I would rather the alien and predator not be intermixed like that. Um, and so, no, there will be no predator in Carbon Gray either. <laughs> <laughs> Although a predator story set during World War One would be pretty interesting. Yeah. 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 Well, the the no, new I... Predator movie, right, would have been, I think, a really good movie if we didn't know that it was going to be a predator movie. Pray, right. yeah, yeah, in the trailer, yeah, yeah, just just promotion wise. Um, there's so many movies that and, and properties I think that would be so much better if you were unaware of the premise going in, yeah, but mm -hmm. that's not how you sell tickets, so yeah, because I think I it, right. that one, I mean, it, I guess that's also a problem for RPG campaigns too, to a degree. Like that one, I felt if you cut the predator out of the trailer. It was still compelling. It's like, okay, First Nation, you got her story. 
and you think, okay, that's what's just a historical sort of thing. Okay, that's interesting. And then, no, there's something else going on that might be supernatural because if you cut the actual predator bit out, there's something interesting. And that was still compelling. And that would have still been like, yeah, I got to see that. That that looks cool. And then you would have seen it, and suddenly, oh my god, it's a predator film. So I think. But that, you know how many people would have seen that and said, "Oh, what a cop out! It's a predator film. Yeah. It's lame." You know what I mean? Because just because they the people are jerks. Because um, how yeah, do you sell not an alien one, but how do you sell a campaign to make it interesting enough to? have someone buy it the gm buy it but not have so much information on the back that the players who so many of them will pick up the books in the stores and read the back will then go oh i know what this is about is they sometimes the outline on the back is sometimes just a little bit too revealing i think well i mean i try and give you a bait and switch like the heart and darkness heart of darkness background uh the back thing it's like oh the, the the company discovered a new life form and they need scientists to go catalog it. Um, and they've hired you and it's a really great deal. It seems a little bit too good. Oh, did I mention it's around a black hole? Okay, right. that's enough to get you interested there. But you, yes. the life form is not what you think it's going to be. Okay, you may think you know what it is, but I guarantee you, you get in that book, you're going to be like, wait a minute, what is this? Okay, right. it's, it, 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 it's the bait and switch, which is literally not a bait and switch. Right. Um, that's when, when I was... Um, when I was taking my writing for comics class at School of Visual Arts back in college, my 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 teacher who wound up becoming my mentor later was Denny O'Neill. Uh, he was in charge of Batman for 15 years. Um, he he wrote the hard traveling heroes, Green Hour, Green Lantern thing in the 60s. Um, <clears throat> so so Denny Denny was a great writer. He one of the things he he wanted us to do, and this applied to the previews blurb for comics but um, he was likening it to novels, was make sure you can write that summary that goes in the back of a novel that makes people say, I got to read this, but doesn't give away the whole damn plot of the novel. Right. Because so right. many of them, I'm like, well, I don't need to read that one now. I'm just putting it back right. on the shelf. Um, so, so, so yeah, it's, it's, it's something that I was literally trained in mm. by, by him for that because, because uh, it was something that used to piss him off. So he wanted to make sure we didn't go do it. Right. <laughs> so um, there's an art to all this stuff. Um, but there comes a point. I mean, okay. So one of the things that I thought would have been awesome, well, oh, and then I found out it almost was, was that if they didn't let us know that Arnold, spoiler alert, was the good Terminator in T2. Mm. Okay. And... Mm. I was watching the movie, you know, years and years and years ago. And I was like, you know, the way he walks down the corridor with the roses and drops the roses and pulls the gun out. Mm. It's almost like Cameron shot this to try and make us think that he was the bad Terminator. But yeah. everything in the advertising made it quite clear that Arnold was the good guy this time around. Yeah, And it turns out that when that advertising was coming out he was super pissed mm. he didn't want them to give that away he wanted people to figure that out in the theater and and but the marketing people were like are you kidding me we're gonna get people in those seats because arnold's the good guy this time mm. so they're right but the story suffered for it mm. right but at the end of the day this is to get people in those seats so the worst thing in the world is trailers from the 1960s. Yep. Because it's like it, it's like Planet of the Apes. It's like discover a world that's been turned upside down and it's really Earth. Here's the Statue of Liberty. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> right. Oh, thanks. <laughs> thanks. I appreciate that. <laughs> um yeah, at least trailers aren't like that anymore. Um, right. But yeah, no, it's 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 a thing. You don't want to give it away. Um <clears throat> And 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 with Chariot, my Chariot of Gods, my 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 plan was to set it up so that you think this is going to be alien. Exactly, yep. derelict ship found. You know, um, um, company wants you to bring something back from it. Da, 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 da. It's like all right, this is alien, right? And that's why that adventure works so well. <clears throat> Your players sit down at the table, like all right, 
show me alien wait what yep. what's going on? yeah what is this yeah if you didn't have that <clears throat> you know and the initial critics for chariot were like it's called alien but it doesn't even have the alien in it yeah, but it's well, a big setting there's lots going yeah. on yeah and if it did have the alien in it your players would have gotten bored real fast but because they did, weren't sure what the hell it was when it happens, they have that fear that they need to feel in an alien game. So um, that's how that worked. Otherwise, it wouldn't have worked. And it would have been probably what, I, I don't know if I, I think I've said it on you guys' show. I've said a lot of things. <clears throat> I shopped that alien as an RPG around for 18 months yeah. before I finally gave up. And a friend of mine got free league, found free league. Um, what do you call it? And for 18 months, they all said to me, it's a one-hit wonder. No one will care. But I think by not, by doing the twists that I did there, by tricking you into thinking it was going to be something it wasn't, that's what made us, uh, us, us made it work and made it successful. So. Well, I think that I, the thing that I, I did say, I think on the last time was that it works as a setting because it's not just alien and you can do a space trucker. You can do a Marine. You can do the scientist and each one is different and you've structured it too, which I think was probably really brilliant now that I've got all the books and been looking more through them. It's a player campaign, not a character campaign because it's, 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 although of course there is a campaign for the colonial Marines, but the moment you went, this is a space trucker campaign only Every following adventure you had to do for it then would have to be a space trucker one in some shape or form. The moment you went, this is a game we're just going to center on space marines, it would always have to be a space marine one. But that's not what it is. The players are the same. The characters are different. So they can be linked, and there's elements that are, but each one is, oh, this is a great idea for a space marine. Cool. That's the middle one. Oh, this is really cool for scientists. That's the third one. Oh, we can do a space trucker. That's the first one. They're all different. So it's not just going, oh, but how do we take this? It'd be a great Marine one, but it's not about, we don't have any, that's not a book out yet, or we don't have that yet. We've got to turn this Marine one into a space trucker one. And then it would, I think it would get more, or if it was Marines, Marine, 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 alien, 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 alien. Oh, this week we're going to go and land on LV 427 and shoot more aliens. And then, We'll do LV428. And guess what we're going to shoot? More <laughs> aliens. And that's not what this is. Everyone is different. And there's other things. And even, even in Chariot, the actual stuff that's going on, all the fringe stuff is impossible to ignore. You can't just go, well, this is the main threat. So let's ignore all of this. You can't. If you just if you do that, things get worse. You still have to sort of work with what's what's going on and and trying to balance as the the party all this stuff that's happening and i think that that's what makes it not this one trick pony because otherwise which is i think the problem with computer games whenever they sort of do these sort of things and even games like halo as much as i love the halo series they kept having to add other villains and stuff because it was like well how do we keep just doing the covenant and i think that you could but I think they kept feeling they got themselves pigeonholed. So then they had to introduce a new galactic villain and the stakes get higher. But the stakes are super high in each one of these adventures. But it's like the Magnificent Seven. The Magnificent Seven has tons of stake, but it's only related to that village and those gunfighters. If it right. gets burned to the ground and they all got killed, it doesn't affect Mexico or the United States as a, mm -hmm. as a nation, but to that one place. And you still feel that stake. They didn't go, well, we're going to do Magnificent Seven 2, but now it's going to be a town, not a village. And then we're going to do a city. And it's, it, they didn't do that. It's just this, centered around this one thing. And that's what these are. Each one is really important to each part that it's in. But it's not like, oh, well, the next one has to be, you've got to save a sector, and then it's going to be save the galaxy. And I think it, it, it works. What's interesting to me... Um about that stuff is like one of the reasons like okay so one of the ways that they trick us into being scared again in an alien movie right when we know what the alien is is by adding a new stage to the life cycle okay 
the queen. Like yep. they're talking about it in 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 the thing that well, what's laying all these eggs? Must be something we haven't seen yet, right? Then when she stumbles into that chamber, you're like, oh, oh holy shit! Okay, everything everything we thought we knew is different now, and now we got to yep. deal with whatever the hell this damn thing is. Alien three comes out of the dog or the steer, depending on which version you're watching. Regardless, it acts much more animalistic. It does things that are weird. She even says, I've never seen one do this before. Okay. It's it's a different version of the alien. Okay. The the neomorphs in, in Covenant are terrifying to me because they're the spore things that and they mm. just they come out of whatever body part they entered. Which mm-hmm. is disturbing in so many ways. Um, so it's all variations. You're still getting the same thing, but it you don't you never feel safe, right? Because what's it going to turn into this time, or how is it going to infect me this time, or you know you don't know what to do, what's going to happen with it. So you're getting variations, well, even though you're technically getting the same thing. Okay. Right. So the escalation isn't an escalation so much as uh, we haven't encountered this part before. This is a new part of the same thing. We just weren't aware of it yet because these circumstances hadn't happened with it yet. Okay. The biggest threat in the alien games, uh, games in, in the game, in the movies, in any of it, right? The biggest threat is really people. It's not the alien. Right. Okay. It's those damn agendas. It's it, people mm-hmm. trying to do things that aren't necessarily going to get everybody out alive. Whether and it's, it's fucking David, rolling too. <laughs> With, <yeah. laughs> the amount of stress dice you got, my god! <laughs> well, but, I mean, stressing out—that's you yeah. being your own worst enemy instead of being able to stay calm. You know, right, um, right. But you know, David's agendas and Ash and 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 even if it's even if it's, even Hudson, yep, like Hudson being a coward could get everybody mm-hmm. killed. You know, uh, it, it, in the end, Hudson definitely redeemed himself, but then he right. died because he redeemed himself. So right. Look with that. Um, so it's a complex, it's a complex property. It's not just that one note thing that everybody seems to think it is. Right. So, and I'm, I'm just glad we were able to make everybody else see that. You know? oh, I, I've told everyone whenever they say, "What what was the most surprising game in a, that we you know bought into or picked up in the last?" few years i always say alien because before looking at it i was interested in it because of the setting obviously but i'd seen the other game in the past and while it was a product of its time so i don't want to slam it too much uh it it did feel like the the limitations were there whereas Mm -hmm. the moment i started reading the core book i was like this is damn interesting as a book alone and i've told people are you a fan of alien and they're like yeah then you can buy this and you'd enjoy it even if you don't play the game there's cool pictures there's new artwork there's new info on gear there's stuff you will find about the setting that you never knew existed it's worth getting and then when we did the first game it played so well and everyone had so much fun and yeah i mean most of the games we've bought into recently uh is in the last three years is either free league or modifius which has a good relationship with free league so there's, there's something there but it's twilight blade runner tales from the loop one ring alien but yeah alien was the big shock it's like it's really cleverly put together and the way the adventures work independently but connected and yeah it's the one i it, i tell people if you want to buy something buy alien because it's it's just really, really good. The um, in regards to the character type things you were saying, what what I would like you to have eventually is a rhythm where it's here's a new here's a new um, cinematic that introduces something you haven't played with yet, such as the Marines, okay? Um, because last time you were space truckers, okay, <clears throat> and then. And then we did this with the Marines already, but we haven't done it with anything else yet. And then that's followed by a campaign book, which basically allows you to tap out being Marine so that you don't really need to be a Marine anymore if you never did. Okay. So it's movie followed by streaming series. Right. Okay. 
followed by a new mm. movie with a new character type and streaming series that milks that character type to death. Okay, so so after Heart of Darkness is scientists slash explorers. Okay, the next the next campaign book is explorers slash colonists. So it's exploring new worlds and colonizing. That's what it comes down to, okay? So it ties in completely with, to it, okay? Then we're probably going to do a new Space Trucker adventure and do a Space Trucker source book, since we never did a source book for it because of the, the yeah. core book. Then we'll probably do corporations and, and androids. And then we'll mm. probably then do the UPP. And then we'll, you know, it, and, and it's just until we've exhausted all the different factions and materials that you can do. And then at that point, I don't know what happens, but if it was me in control of it at that point, then I'd start doing case files on types of aliens and things like that. Because mm -hmm. at that point, you've pretty much gone through everything. Um, mm -hmm. So you need to, we need to change, we need to add some new elements to this to change things up. Um, <clears throat> even with the campaign books, I write them not expecting your characters to survive because right. if when writing when writing the when writing the colonial marine one if your character dies you're going to get a replacement in your unit you know yeah. what i mean you know you may go for a couple of missions down a couple of people until you get a, re, a, a refresh and resupply you know and then you're going to have new people come aboard um with the colonists the way the campaign is going to be set up is that there's a colonial mission which has smaller missions going to explore smaller areas of space. So again, you'll get replacements. You know, it's it's designed so that replacements are easy coming. It's not going to be, it's not designed so that if you die, all right, well, I guess the whole team is fucked because now they'll never have that position right. refilled. Right. Um <clears throat> What do you call it? I don't think. I think it's. I think it would be a mistake to design it, expecting you to have your same character all the way through. Right. Um, well, isn't the first quote in the? I could be wrong here, but isn't the first quote in the core book, um, Ash saying, "I'd like to say good luck" or yeah, something? But <laughs> yeah, it's on the back cover. Oh, it's on the back cover. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's his one about I, I your chances, but... Yeah. <laughs> um, so no matter what, because of this, it's not it's not your typical role-playing experience. So, But yeah. the question is, at this point, what is your typical role-playing experience? Okay? The, the market is still dominated by Dungeons & Dragons, although who knows if that's changing with the big fiasco. Mm. That, yeah, know? that was great. <laughs> Dungeons and Dragons and Pathfinder make up most of the market, don't they? Yeah, yeah, and they're the two big ones. Market. Yeah, and then and then the next biggest one is Call of Cthulhu, which only has yep. fifteen in the market, and then after that is everybody else, you know, um, <clears throat> which is pretty crazy when you think about it. <laughs> and that's yeah. where we live, so <laughs> we don't do Pathfinder or Dungeons and Dragons. We do all your games and. Blade Runner and L five R and Tales from the Loop and uh, Star Trek and The One Ring and yeah, you know, all the stuff that's not in the top tier. <laughs> how how is this is a weird question for me to be asking? But Tales from the Loop how 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 much of a campaign did you get out of Tales from the Loop? Uh, we got eighteen parts from the okay, and that that's was from cool. the core book. Yeah, that was from the core book. I've I've um, never played it. I own it. I've just never played it, but I want to because it. It. it I watched a few episodes of the of the TV series. Mm -hmm. did, did you see the TV series? Yes. Yeah, I watched a few episodes, and it was it was really interesting and really depressing. And I was <laughs> like, I don't know if I want to keep watching this or if I want to play it first and then rewatch the rest of it. You know what I mean? Um, um it's one of our favorite ones. It's got a yeah, although, yeah. um, <clears throat> it was it's funny. The only actual kid is my son and we played tales and at the end of the first episode which was the genesis of the half-witted crow at the end of it he just looked at the rest of us and said 
you must all have been pretty fucked up kids. (laughs) 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 But it's we love it though. That's um, Mm. it's an extreme RP game because you can't die, and it's then straight away asking the players to buy in, and it's so important because. When you've taken away that, like, it doesn't mean nothing bad can happen. Bad things can happen all over the place and they can happen to other people, but the kid can't die, which is your usual threat in a normal game. Your character can die. Well, not in Tales. They don't want to kill kids. So straight away, though, you're asking the players to buy in, almost in a way I'd say that you have to an alien. It's very easy to talk to someone who doesn't get it. And they go, okay, there's a face hugger. Yeah. So we throw the guy out the airlock. He's your brother. You're just going to throw your brother out the airlock. Well, yeah, he's got a face hugger. What is that? Well, it's a, it's impregnant. How do you know that? Yeah. Oh, I saw the movie. Mm. Right. You saw the movie. They, they don't have the buy-in. And it sort of works like that too. It's sort of like, okay, you can't die. So you don't know that this robot or flood or whatever is happening is a, a mortal threat to your character, but your character doesn't know that. So it does rely on the players to go, okay, I'm going to buy in as if this was a TV show and I'm going to play my character the way the situation is asking. And I'm lucky that that's the group I have. And it was a lot of fun. They like talking too in character. There's a lot of discussion. They don't meta stuff. So anytime they have a plan, they will talk about it in character and a lot of those plans are terrible because they're plans that a kid could come up with rather than necessarily a well thought out adult and it makes perfect sense when they do it so yeah i love tales i think tales is a really clever game as well i think Mm. yeah absolutely um i um it's fine i had a girlfriend who we'd be watching things and it's like Let's pretend it's um. I, I think this was a Voyager episode, but whatever it is, the the decks are collapsing from comp- they're being compressed because it's lost the pressure, mm. and the decks are collapsing, and everybody's going to die, and someone's holding the door open for the people running towards it, and she's just like, just close the door, you're going to lose the whole ship, and I'm like, yeah, because you don't care about those people. I think you're not thinking about it. Like you're in that moment. You're not right. You're, mm. you're, you're thinking about this from your couch, eating popcorn. Right. <laughs> right. It's not the same thing as if you're in a situation, you don't want to kill somebody, you know, right. you, you hoping they're going to get their asses there soon enough. Um. So, so there, there was never any, to her, there was never any real jeopardy. There were people being stupid. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, right. I was like, you know, no, no, you need to be able to be absorbed by the story. You need to feel like you're there. What would I do in that situation? I would want to save that person's life until it was clear that there was no way I was going to be able to, you know. Right. I'm not going to, I'm not going to kill myself, but when that clock ticks down and there's two seconds left, is when I'm going to hit the button to close the door. Right. Um, mm. The other thing that Alien and Tales is like, then they're, they're those yeah. story driven games, you have to be thinking, in a story, yeah, the dice still add that because some people I saw the criticism was, um, you know, the, there's no risk and the roles don't matter. No, the roles do matter. They on, still on matter what? on, on like chaos? tales, yeah. And it's like mm. it does matter. It matters just as much as in any other game. It still helps you understand the outcome of the event you're trying to do, but right. it approaches mm. it in a different way and, um. I think it has one mechanic that Alien doesn't, which I, I think I could be wrong. I don't think I am. But they have um, a collective amount of successes for certain things. So let's say there's a boss fight at the end and the boss might have 12 successes <clears throat> required to beat it. So you go, what's your approach going to be Adam, Emily and Drew? And then there's a little bit of meta there because you will go, okay, my character is going to do this, going to do this, going to do this. And then you'll roll your dice pool based on that, count up your sixes, and you go, I got four, I got three, I got two. Okay. And is anyone taking condition? Anyone doing it? And if you get enough, then it's like, okay, now you succeed. How do you do this? And I just, it's handed over to you as the players to now describe this scene 
not so much me, the GM, which is a huge difference to so many traditional games where the GM is almost in control of everything. I've given you the problem, robot with a machine gun. You've yeah. got enough successes. You've beaten it. So how does it do this? Yeah, you know, how do you how do you and then everyone starts working together and uh telling the that this scene and this this sort of story much more like around the campfire and the dice absolutely played a part. It wasn't I like, I like inconsequential. That. And Tails does that. And everyone sort of backs each other up and adds to it, and then you get these little bits and <laughs> Dylan jumped on the back of it and he's like, I succeeded. What do I do now? <laughs> <laughs> um that's another interesting thing you, you these people who say like they complained that the dice don't mean anything right okay so most of not that there's a lot of complaints but the most of the complaints i have seen about say destroyer of worlds okay <clears throat> it's it's always I don't like this thing. I don't like this thing that he's added in Act 2. So I removed it before we played. And I don't like this other thing, so I took it out. And then we played, and everyone hated it. It wasn't fun. And I'm like, so you're blaming my adventure when you modified it before mm -hmm. your players got to it. <laughs> mm -hmm. you, you see what I'm saying? It's like, it's like maybe that thing was there for a reason. Mm. You got to look at balance before you go. Well, I don't like that. I don't like that. I don't like that. You're sticking right. it out. Maybe, maybe the guy who wrote it put it in there for a reason, and and you should look at. Well, wait. What does that do? Oh, that affects that over there. I can't take that out unless I replace it with something else that will keep that balance there. You know, it, it it's like the, it's like they think that I sat here in one night and I just hit on the keyboard and then turned it in <laughs> no we, we thought this out <laughs> we thought these things out they, 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 it, it came to a point where it's like in a play test maybe it came back hey the, uh, this totally unbalanced the thing so we're like oh all right well what about this they play test it again oh that works okay that's why we put it there don't just arbitrarily remove things look at the whole big picture first please um they, but there's the, easter the eggs too if if people cut something out and that was where one of the Easter eggs is, they get to Heart of Darkness and suddenly there might be a little thing that a player might go, oh, that's related to that thing we did back in Chariot. But it's not there now because that's been cut out because they thought that this was whatever. The um, funny thing, actually, it's funny thing with that. Sometimes it gets it happens at the publisher level. Um I had had the Wayland Storm Rifle originally in the armory on in Chariot of the Gods because that rifle existed at the time that that ship took off. And someone at the publisher was like, oh, well, we just use this gun we have already and swapped the, the, the pulse rifle in there without thinking about the fact that the pulse rifle is 70 years, negative 70 years old at that point, right? Mm -hmm. So... <clears throat> So when I saw that come back in before it went out, I wrote a little thing saying, because they didn't want the new stats for a new rifle in there. So I wrote the little thing saying that the ship had been boarded by a Marine team before this, and that will tie in to what's happening in one of the later books. And then they didn't put that in either. <laughs> so <laughs> the, I saw in the complaints well, actually, this gun would never be on this. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, damn it! Uh, so, I put that. I, I I put hints in the campaign book that that the, that that's because in the in Destroyer Worlds, the military has the samples from Chariot. Right. So clearly, before the players mm. got it, they must have gotten it from the the thing. So I I I. I explained it in the campaign book that they had been a team that had boarded the blah, 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 blah. But by then it's too late because everybody thinks you don't know your business. Right. Um, but yeah, so it's it's like it, it, I feel like if you're reviewing this, and not you personally, but whoever, yep. you know, yep. and you're gonna you're gonna either bash it or say it's good, 
you have to you have to run it the way it's presented mm. Mm. Um, because you can't bash something that has my name on it when you've gone and turned it into your own adventure right uh, so run it the way it's written and then tell me how bad it is and i believe you because <laughs> you, you see what i'm saying <laughs> Yeah, um, I, I mean, classic example would be the old Star Wars West End games adventures. Um, I think we played one the other uh, couple of months ago. Was it Starfall or something? Was it Starfall? We did Starfall and Tatooine Manhunt. Yeah, where the captain of the ship is going to scuttle the ship and decides to give the crew, uh, uh, the the escaping crew, uh, an ATST to teach them a lesson. Okay. On board an Imperial Star Destroyer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's Starfall. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, I will beat you anyway. I am that good and I will teach you a lesson. You may use this ATST. ST, yep. <laughs> and I will twirl my little mustache while you get into it and then I will destroy you while you're in it. <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> what is this? I have not seen that adventure since it came out. That really happens in there? Yes. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and the what game did, is so good. Like, it's... what? Did, how did this happen? The first thing that would happen is that that commander, second-in-command, would relieve him of command. <laughs> <laughs> Unfit for duty. Yeah. You don't give you don't give major weapons to bad guys. <laughs> right. Like, there, yeah, we're the bad guys to him. Yeah, no, you're right. <laughs> Yes, yes. <laughs> Arm the terrorists on our cruiser, please. Arm the terrorists. <laughs> I mean, oh. I, I know the, the the writer was probably thinking, how can I let the players, you know, and the characters get access to an ATST? But having the villain be, uh, I am going to teach you rebels a lesson, but you may use yeah. that ATST just to show you how superior we are. It's like. Mm -mm 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 -mm. <laughs> He's drunk with power. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Too much blue milk. <laughs> yeah. Uh see, I used to use those um I, I never ran any of the Star Wars adventures. I mm. bought them all and used them as source materials. Like um I, I, I plucked I like I love judo cast from Tattoo Man so I, I Oh like yeah. Them. Yeah. Right. Um <laughs> I like the idea of this jerk who was running around thinking, no, I'll take Boba Fett's jobs. Right. Um, and I thought it was great that they did a comic later on where uh, Boba Fett's like, excuse me. Yep. Um, Twin Engines of Destruction, that was the comic. Yeah, um, that was a good comic too, though. Like, awesome. that was also with the one where Dengar's like, so why do we never see your face? And he turned around in the shadows in the, the panel and he's like, this is my face. <laughs> And I thought that was that guy gets fit. That guy understands when they were writing that comic. Sorry, that was my um, tangent. <laughs> no, it's, it's a lovely tangent. Um, what do you call it? Yeah, so it, I mean, we've been all over the place with this, but I, it, it's just like mm. it, you'll you'll see it. It, it. Number one complaint I've seen in adventures is, well, I thought this was dumb when I read it, so I took it out, and then we played the adventures, and my players weren't happy, and no one had a good time. And 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 all, my first thought is, what would have happened if you hadn't taken that out? Right. Because if you hadn't taken it out and you got the same result, then I I could say, okay, maybe the story has problems. But you just invalidated any argument you have. You know, it, it, it's um, this hamburger tastes terrible. But I didn't like the burger, so I took it out and just made it a bun before I gave it to somebody. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Good job. Yep. Um, I think one problem I've had, depending on the group, has been they play to win rather than play to experience. And I think if people ask me what was the biggest thing I've noticed in, geez, 40 years of role playing, I think. So many more modern games, which are the ones that we're drawn to, ones you have written, Tales, Dune, Blade Runner, they are more about experiencing than a victory. Things 
especially my old AD and D and yeah, it's, it's all fun and playing with your friends and that, but it was a lot more victory orientated. And when I get groups that play to win, even D and D they, there was one, they cast the, ex, they worked out exactly the right spell to cast at exactly the right moment to stop the guy fleeing. But that fleeing was meant to be the dramatic rooftop chase that would go on for eight pages. It was going to end where they would then learn that there was another villain involved. Uh, and they were able to mitigate all of this with one spell. And because the thief was a construct, it didn't have any information to give them. And then they missed then that chase, which was meant to be the exciting part of that chapter. This was a bought adventure, not one I'd made myself. They mm. also then didn't learn that there was another villain involved and when they'd finished it they'd said it was good but we thought it would be more fun and it's like well yeah you actively tried to work against <laughs> experiencing what the adventure was trying to be it makes sense that this wasn't as much fun i had another group that were able to cut out a third of the map completely they just didn't do it thereby missing out on all the stuff that was in there and they said the same thing and i'm like you actively played to win and win you did but you didn't have fun because it was just what's the most expedient most easiest yeah we kicked its ass yeah you did well done but we didn't well, have here's fun one the, here's one of the psychological problems that leads to that it's called a role-playing game g-a-m <laughs> yeah. you can play games to so we need to start releasing RPEs, role playing experiences. Mm. I like that. Yeah, because that's what Alien is. That's what Tales is. It's an experience. You, you, you've written the Alien movie that you wanted to write. We're playing in the Alien movie we want to be in, and if we play it to win, you wouldn't have Burke separating himself at that mm. moment. You wouldn't have Ripley trying to go down the chute to get Newt. You wouldn't have Bishop not leave when he could have. You wouldn't have any of those moments. You wouldn't have Gorman blow himself up with Vasquez. Spoilers for people that haven't seen the movie from 35 years ago, but it just, you know, you wouldn't have those because they'd play to win and they'd be like, that's not winning. That, you know, my, my character wouldn't. And it's like, what's important? He's got, for the first time ever, he's got Vasquez's respect. Okay, he, they're dying together, but that mattered. It mattered to Gorman in that moment. He found who he was right at the end, and that mattered to both of them. That's important. That's an experience, but it's not necessarily the winning. Character, that's a completion of a character arc right there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. And I think that's that's a big part of some of the more modern games that I very much like, and that's, why I think, why I'm, I'm so happy that it's in Alien, and I definitely saw it in Carbon Grey. Keeps us interested. It's there. There's so much more that role playing can be used for than it is, and and you know, I I don't know. Maybe this whole fiasco with with uh, wizards is going to help other people see that there's so much more out there. So we would like to thank Drew for taking the time to talk to us about Carbon Gray and all things role playing. And we hope that you found something of value by spending your time with us and absolutely check out Carbon Grey. We are very impressed by it and alien. And if you like science fiction, Space 1999, it's just been announced. They're coming back, the graphic novels. And we will put links in the description to where you can pick up, obtain and follow both us and the things that Drew's doing. Well, thanks, thanks for having me, guys. Um, as always, I, I always have a good time with you. So thank you. <laughs>